Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I am your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Thank you to our generous underwriters on Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information and Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Tuesday, August 2nd, we are studying Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 6 to 25. Moses begins his first sermon by giving the people of Israel a history lesson concerning the Lord's initial command to enter the promised land. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Stephen Preuss. Pastor Preuss serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in Vinton, Iowa. Pastor Preuss, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Thanks. Good to be back. So we get started this morning, Pastor Preuss. Give us some context. We're only a few verses into the book of Deuteronomy, but as we begin this first speech or sermon or address of Moses, what should we know going into this, this first part of the text? Yeah, we've already heard the preamble here, and uh, what really Deuteronomy's uh, doing is it's beginning by telling us that Moses spoke to the people of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment to them, as we hear in verse 3. And uh, at this time, he's now east of the Jordan in the wilderness in the land of Moab, and he is undertaking to explain the law of the Lord to this new generation of Israelites uh, who would be the ones who would actually actually take possession of the promised land. Um, The previous generation had heard the law before. Uh, We know that the law was given to them at Sinai, at Horeb, uh, but they were forced to wander in the wilderness because of their refusal to enter the promised land 40 years earlier. Uh, We'll actually hear about that next time. Uh, And the Lord had told them to go in. They didn't. And we'll kind of, we'll get right up to that uh, today. But our text for today actually begins with the first content of what Moses told this new generation of Israelites. So he begins this sermon. He's got a series of sermons. That's kind of what Deuteronomy is. Um, It's kind of the swan song of Moses. Uh, given them in this new generation kind of a preparation of what they're going to then experience and practice and live out uh, in in the promised land. Yeah, the, the swan song or the farewell address, the, the last sermon, Moses' goodbye, this is what we're going to encounter in the book of Deuteronomy. And as, as we said in the introductory program yesterday, almost the whole book of Deuteronomy is sermons or addresses of Moses. If If we were to you know, I mean, Jesus' words get put in red in the New Testament in some editions of the Bible. Maybe if we were to put Moses' words in blue or something like that, it'd be a lot of blue words, okay? This is this is all of Moses' words, which I, I think is sometimes a, a challenge for us as modern readers of the book of Deuteronomy. We, we like the books of Genesis and the first part of Exodus where, quote, stuff happens. The book of Deuteronomy, it's a lot of addresses, which we're not as used to listening to. And how do you, how do you think we can how should we approach these these words of Moses in a in a helpful and not exciting is maybe not the right way but so that we don't I get bored I, I hate we shouldn't get bored with the word of God you know but how do we how do we approach these Pastor Preuss? Yeah, I think we have to see that this is a progression forward. Um, you kind of Deuteronomy is a little bit unusual in that you kind of expect us just to kind of go straight into the the promised land. And, and we don't. We kind of get this rehearsal of what has already happened. And, and really the reason why is because he's explaining to them uh, the things that had already been explained to the previous generation before they rejected the covenant uh, and rejected the promised land and God made them wander for 40 years. And so now he's going to give to them exactly what he had given the previous generation and give to them the proper understanding of the covenant, uh, the stipulations for that, you know, the moral law, the ceremonial law, the civil law, things like that. Um, and and then he's going to have this ratification of the covenant, and, and uh, the covenant is just going to continually be presented before them. 
and kind of the history of what had happened and what they will then be doing. And so it is, it might seem like it's uh, some repetition, but I was just reading the other day about this repetition. You know, we need, need to become like children again. Our kids aren't afraid to mm. say again, again, right after you read a, a story to them. And so um, we we shouldn't be uh, upset with this too, to get it rehearsed again to us, especially since it is something that is is new to this this generation. Uh, that is going into the promised land. Well, I, I appreciate what you said about the kids. My my kids do the same thing with with books. Read it again, over and over again, and and God grant that same attitude when it comes to His Word. And, and as I've I've told the Bible class here in Smithville several times, you know, if, if God takes the time to repeat something in His Word, probably important and worth our time to read it and learn it twice or or however many times He repeats it. So so very yeah. very well said. Well, one other thing, too, about Deuteronomy is I, I find it interesting that, like, in the temptation of Jesus, for example, he, he only quotes Deuteronomy. Yeah. Right? And so, I mean, there are other places where uh, we see that the importance of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6, is going to become so important uh, with the Shema. And um, we, we know that there are certain portions of Deuteronomy that there might be repetitions, but there's also sometimes going into things a little bit more. Uh, for the sake of of the next generation, so and for the rest of, of of posterity, for for even even us today and into the future of the Christian Church. As you were reminding us of the the setting, that these are people who you know they're on the cusp of the promised land. I, I wonder if there's perhaps just with that setting an example for us thinking of of our time of waiting. You know, you can imagine Israel there on the other side of the Jordan. They've already conquered part of the land that will be theirs on that east side of the Jordan, and, and now they're going to cross. And I can imagine the people being ready to go. Come on, Moses, let's let's go. Let's go over there. But Moses says, well, wait, you, you need to hear these words from God first, and you get the whole book of Deuteronomy. I, I wonder if there's something there for us as just a, an example or a picture of our Christian lives right now, as we're waiting, we're waiting for our Lord's return, and no doubt we pray Come, Lord, come quickly. But as we do, what's what's the business of the the Christian church? It is to be listening to the word of God, waiting to go into the promised land of of the resurrection. I I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, that's great. I think that that's exactly it. Listen to sermons. That's what you're <laughs> that's what you're waiting for. You're going to listen to Moses sermons here uh, throughout Deuteronomy, and that's what these people. This this is the new generation. And each generation needs to hear it again and again and again. And uh, yeah, we're waiting to go to the promised land, the the new heaven and new earth. And yeah, we say, come Lord Jesus. Uh, but in the meantime, we don't twiddle our thumbs. We are in great anticipation for that which is to come. But we have a lot of wisdom to learn mm -hmm. before we see wisdom himself. Mm -hmm. uh, and so... Yeah, this is this is a good kind of parallel to what we are experiencing. I like that take. All right, let's go ahead then and jump into Moses's first sermon. We're picking up the text in Deuteronomy 1, verse 6. The, the previous verse said, Moses undertook to explain this law, saying, and this is where verse 6 starts. The Lord our God said to us in Horeb, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey and go to the hill country of the Amorites and to all their neighbors in the Arabah, in the hill country and in the low land and in the Negev, and by the seacoast, the land of the Canaanites and Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them and to their offspring after them. At that time I said to you, I am not able to bear you by myself. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and behold, you are today as numerous as the stars of heaven. May the Lord, the God of your fathers, make you a thousand times as many as you are and bless you as he has promised you. How can I bear by myself the weight and burden of you and your strife? Choose for your tribes wise, understanding, and experienced men, and I will appoint them as your heads. And you answered me, the thing that you have spoken is good for us to do. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and experienced men, and set them as heads over you, commanders of thousands, commanders of hundreds, commanders of fifties, commanders of tens, and officers throughout your tribes. And I charged your judges at that time, 
Hear the cases between your brothers, and judge righteously between a man and his brother, or the alien who is with him. You shall not be partial in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not be intimidated by anyone, for the judgment is God's. And the case that is too hard for you, you shall bring to me, and I will hear it. And I commanded you at that time all the things that you should do. Then we set out from Horeb, and went through all that great and terrifying wilderness that you saw, on the way to the hill country of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us. And we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I said to you, You have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving to us. See, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up, take possession, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has told you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Then all of you came near me and said, Let us send men before us, that they may explore the land for us, and bring us word again of the way by which we must go up, and the cities into which we shall come. The thing seemed good to me, and I took twelve men from you, one man from each tribe. And they turned and went up into the hill country, and came to the valley of Eshkol, and spied it out. And they took in their hands some of the fruit of the land, and brought it down to us, and brought us word again, and said, It is a good land that the Lord our God is giving us. That takes us to the end of our text for today, the middle of chapter 1, that's Deuteronomy 1, verses 6 to 25. So Moses begins with a history lesson. We get a lot of previous history from the first four books of Moses. They're going to show up in this first address of Moses, which we're beginning today. Uh, what? How does Moses start his sermon? What's What's his introduction in the first couple verses of, of our text? Yeah, in the first couple of verses, we we talk, we see him talking about how, and you know, these are the first words that he actually is speaking to them. Uh, he says that the Lord our God said to us in Horeb, you have stayed long enough at this mountain, and then turn and take your journey, go to the hill country, and he starts describing this land. And, and so what he's doing here is he's actually describing the vastness of the promised land to them. And... Um, the Lord had told Israel at, at Horeb or at, at Sinai to leave the mountain, journey to the promised land, take possession of it. And this land is the, the, the land that the Lord promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We hear that repeatedly. And uh, we know that from, from the book of Genesis, of course. And here in Deuteronomy 1, we actually have the broadest description of the boundaries of the promised land given to us uh, in scripture. You also, you know, it's it's uh, very much the same dimensions that you get uh, given to Abram as well, but here it's very specifically described. And so you have the hill country of the Amorites and all their neighbors in the Arabah. Uh, this includes the area to the, the west of the Dead Sea, the area running north to south through central and southern Palestine, which was later allocated to the tribes of Ephraim and Judah. You have the, the hill country and the lowland. This refers to the area of the Shephelah, which is a, a hilly region in Judah uh, between the central highlands and the, the Mediterranean. And then you have the Negev, or Negev. Uh, it's this hot, dry desert area in, in southern Palestine. It borders the even drier area of the wilderness of Zin, which is which is just south of it. Uh, then you have by the sea coast that refers to the southern coast of the Mediterranean Sea, uh, and you have the Philistines who, who occupy that area. And then you have the land of the Canaanites in Lebanon as far as the Great River, the River Euphrates, and that's everything then north of Philistia and the Negev, all the way to like 200 miles north and east uh, until you get to this western fork of the Euphrates River. And that would then flow east to the Persian Gulf. So um, it's kind of hard to paint the map uh, uh, on on uh, just listening to it. But um, take a look at the map and just see this is a, a vast land that the Lord was promising them. And he is repeating the promised land and in, in great detail here, uh, showing that he knows exactly the land that he has promised to Abram. And that it has not, he has remembered this and it is going to be given to them just as he said. Um, now, just to note, we only see Israel actually take full possession of this whole area in the future as, as is actually described here during the reigns of, of, from King Saul and King David and King Solomon. So um, 
we know this isn't it's in some sort of a vacant land where they just kind of come in and pitch their tents uh they actually had to fight for it and we know the lord's on their side as they do that so uh there is a lot here just describing all of this as you look into then the rest of of the history of the people of israel a lot of these areas are going to reappear as they continue to move into the promised land. One of the the points that Professor Harstad made when it comes to geography within the book of Deuteronomy, even when we're not precisely sure maybe how to pronounce the names today, or sometimes when we're not exactly sure where things are, although you you did a great job of, of helping us to visualize this, and again, pull out your map. But, but one of the points that he made was the fact that when we see these real places in the scripture, we should be reminded that this is how the Lord works. He's not working in some sort of fairy land or, or never, never land. He's actually working in real places with real people doing actual things in history. And and this should bring us great comfort. So, so I mean, more so than even just beyond the actual land that's there, just the fact that, as you said, God remembers his promise. This is a very although it may seem strange to us, theologically, this this strikes me as a very gospel-centered approach to the beginning of Moses' sermon, if I can put it that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the inheritance is uh, the, the promise. You know, the covenant was made, and the Lord made the covenant with Abram, and it was a, a one-sided covenant that the Lord uh, would actually— you know, as he passed through uh, the animal uh, at night as the light and said that he would die if he would break this covenant. And he promised to Abram to make of him a great nation and to give him this land, uh, as well as the, the promise of the Messiah, of course. And so this land being given to them uh, in conjunction with the covenant to Abram, uh, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob is, is very much a a uh, concrete realization of God fulfilling his promise in time and um, ultimately pointing, as we know, to the new creation and, and, and what we will inherit as the meek who inherit the earth, the new heavens and the new earth. Mm. The other thing that stands out to me about Moses Moses' introduction here is the the matter of timing that he brings up at the beginning. So in, in verse 6, the Lord our God said to us in Horeb, this is... He's rewinding the clock 40 years. They, they were in Horeb 40 years ago. That's when they were out Mount Sinai. And the Lord says here, you know, you've, you've been here long enough. The, the, I think the, the gospel, again, reminder that we see here is that they are where they are at the Lord's direction and guidance. I think that's one of the things you see throughout the narrative, particularly in the book of Exodus, but also as it, it continues forward is that the people go where they go and they go when they go at the Lord's direction. And having that reminder at the beginning of the book of Deuteronomy, I think is is important for this new generation that, as we said, maybe is very eager to enter the promised land, but first listen to these words of Moses and, and rem- receive this reminder who's the one who's been leading you all along, who's been making his promises and remembering his promises, and now he's going to be keeping his promises. Again, it's, and I know it, like some of these details, like, well, that's, that's great, Moses. But I, I think seeing it in that light helps us to, to take it and like, wow, this, is, this really is a very, uh, very apt introduction to his first sermon and grounds the whole thing in, this is what God has been doing for you. And then, by way of extension, what he's going to get to later in the book of Deuteronomy, God's going to keep doing these things for you. So be faithful to him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, and it's quite the comparison to what the previous generation had done. I mean, it, the Horeb to Kadesh Barnea is, it would take 11 days on foot. So why did it take him 40 years? That's right. <laughs> you know, it's because the Lord is in control and, and what's, it's kind of the opposite with this new generation who's got this anticipation to go in. Uh, the previous generation, uh, as we'll, we'll end up hearing, uh, and as, as we know, they, they did not want to go. And that's why they they had to wander for 40 years, because they spied out the land for 40 days for as many days as they then were there. They had to wander. Mm. Um, and so, 
Yeah, the Lord is in control, and he he. What I find always amazing too is that he will never let man's desire to thwart his plans ever win out, and so he still will be gracious in spite of needing to chastise. Uh, he will continue to fulfill his covenant. Mm-hmm. And yeah, his that, promise. yeah, no, that that's very well said, and I think that really ties in again to that last verse that we looked at in verse eight about this matter of the Lord. He's He's got his promise. He knows what it is, and he will fulfill it. And and as we will see as this sermon progresses, you know, the people are going to rebel. We know how this story does go, but God is is set out from the get-go as the faithful one, the one who has cared for his people, the one who remembers his promise, the one who will fulfill his promise. And that's how Moses begins this sermon. And I, I think that this is one of the themes that we'll see throughout the book of Deuteronomy is God's faithfulness. Now, of course, that's going to be contrasted with the people's unfaithfulness, as we'll see. But but in today's text, that's really where Moses is starting, is the faithfulness of God. And, and we see it just in the the description of geography and in the timeline here at the outset of Moses' sermon. So he he moves from that, that's where he starts, into verse 9, and, and he starts by by talking about some delegation that he did in the within the history. What is what does Moses say about well the number of the people of Israel and how he how he began to provide for leadership among them? Yeah, I mean, it kind of strikes me as strange that he starts here, but he does, and um, he, he says he you know he appoints leaders in Israel. So this is actually recounted uh, much more fully in Exodus eighteen. Uh, but what happened? And as it's described there, Moses' father, Jethro, had noticed that Moses was overwhelmed with people bringing legal disputes to him. Uh, he was trying to handle it all himself, and you can only imagine how many people just line up, uh, especially knowing our, our sinful nature and our desire uh, for other people's things and wanting to, to have what we want. So anyway, all of these legal disputes are going on, and he can't handle it. And so Jethro notices this. He tells Moses that's not good. This is this is a bad thing, and it was too heavy for him. So his father-in-law says uh, to place able men to act as chiefs, to act as judges over the people. And the great matters he Moses would still have, they'd bring those to him, but the lighter matters would go to these these men. And so now here in Deuteronomy, Moses is recounting kind of this solution. And uh, it's. I love the way he he starts it. He he starts it with this thankfulness that the Lord had multiplied the people of Israel. So, this is not something he's complaining about that he has to appoint these leaders. Uh, he is actually references the promise that was made to Abraham in Genesis 15 that as numerous as the stars of heaven. Uh, this is a good thing. So he even he goes on and asks the Lord to make them a thousand times as many as they were. You know, even as he's bearing this too heavy burden, he's kind of reflecting on this. Uh, and he wants them to be blessed, uh, just as the Lord had promised. But this great increase in size still had to to be dealt with. So there are challenges, and he needed to heed this advice of his father-in-law and have the Israelites choose for their tribes uh, men whom Moses would then appoint as their heads. So that's that's what he's recounting here in, in, in this next section. I was glad to hear that you think this is perhaps a, a strange place for Moses to go because I it has me scratching my head a little bit too as to why he he goes here next, and, and in, in fact because it does seem it's actually like a a step back in terms of the at least the way the book of Exodus narrates it Exodus eighteen is as you said this is where Jethro gives him this advice and and verses six through eight are really like that's later in the narrative that's when they're leaving Horeb so it it does seem a little bit strange I I wonder I don't know did you have any thoughts on on why this is where Moses goes next is there uh, this is the only thing that I I could think of is that perhaps he's he's trying to give the people an example of a time when the the their fathers actually were faithful in the way that they handled something at least that's and I, we'll talk more about those the following verses on the other side of the break but maybe i don't know do you have a thought as to why why is this the place moses goes next yeah, i think there might be something to that uh i think also he's just kind of setting up here uh what he's going to talk about later um 
which begins in, in what we're going to go through today, where he he does send out the, the spies into the promised land. And then that kind of explains why they were wandering for 40 years mm. uh, and that why he's now giving the law again and they're going to enter in again and why he started these sermons, you know. Um, but, yeah, I, I think also showing the, the faithfulness of this of, of Moses as a servant and mm. as of the people of Israel uh and, and giving them an example of saying hey listen this started off the way it should but then it it went awry now you're about to go in again and let us listen to how it went awry so that we can take this as a warning uh as as you now enter in as the new generation so that you may not uh, make the same mistakes that your fathers made mm. yeah and so yeah well and i think what you said too about like verse 11, the, the prayer of Moses and the thanksgiving of Moses in, in verse 10 for what the Lord had done, that the fact that the people have grown and that this generation is standing here ready to enter the promised land, this too is evidence of God's faithfulness to his promise. Now it did present this challenge that Moses needed to deal with, and he did so with, with wisdom given to him by his father-in-law. And I would say this is godly wisdom that's shown. But again, yeah. we see we see an example of God's faithfulness to his promise yet again here at the beginning of of Moses' sermon. So we're going to keep looking at this part of the sermon on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We are talking with Pastor Stephen Preuss about Deuteronomy chapter 1. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. What do you think of when you hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable. A college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran. A college that won't take a dime of federal funding. A college that teaches the best of our Western heritage. A college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College. A college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org. Subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Tuesday, August 2nd. We're studying Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 6 to 25 with Pastor Stephen Preuss. He serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in Vinton, Iowa. Pastor Preuss, prior to the break, we've seen Moses recount the moment in Israel's history where God has been multiplying his people according to his promise given to Abraham. Moses is thankful for this. Moses continues to pray that the Lord would would fulfill his promise. And yet he also recognizes at that moment, recounted in, in Exodus 18, that there's just too many people for him as one man to take care of. Now, it's, it's not here in Deuteronomy 1, but it is there in Exodus 18 about his father-in-law Jethro and the role that he plays. He knows, Moses knows he needs help. In Deuteronomy 1, we hear about how he went about doing that. So take us into, and, and as you need to, go to Exodus 18, stay in Deuteronomy 1. What happens? How does Moses go about getting the help that he needs in leading this large group of people? So you can kind of notice that he was meticulous and intentional with how he did it. Uh, the first thing that you notice here is that he he actually got the the agreement of the people. So he wanted them to choose these experienced uh, men. And uh, it's quite a, a, a wise leadership for him to urge them to, to choose their own chiefs. Uh, and then obviously he's the one who's going to approve them. You know, the Lord chose Moses. And so Moses knows this. He's been chosen. But Moses also had this respect for uh, the the people of the, that the Lord gave him to serve. And uh, he delegated authority, and, and then uh, they agreed. The thing that you have spoken is, is good for us to do. And so 
this is just kind of in, in basic understanding within the church uh, and in general that the way you rule can be done. There's an old distinction between ruling with authority and ruling with power and power will take, 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 and authority will give and delegate uh, because you are actually showing trust in others who are then qualified and, and you have some requirements as we'll discuss later, but it does show a wisdom uh, and a kind of a, a gracious way of, of not only trying to get things off his own shoulders, but actually wanting to, to entrust this leadership uh, to others for the sake of the people of Israel. Okay, so he he gets their agreement, and again, this is well. I, what I what I appreciate about this account is that on the one hand, this seems like just well, that seems like a really good idea. You know, I mean, it's just kind of basic, if I can say. And common sense is maybe not quite the right term, but like when you think about the opposite way that he could have done it and the the perils that that might have brought, if he just says you, you, and you, you're in charge, and and leaves it at that, you can see how that might have gone wrong. On the other hand the way Moses approaches it, it has that, again, common sense, I'm not sure if that's quite the right term, but it, it's it's just wonderful, I think, to see how kind of the the way that seems wise is actually godly wisdom, like just the very practical nature of godly wisdom. I, I appreciate just that very basic point from this narrative. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it, it shows that, too, he's I think emphasizing the fact that he, in his wisdom, is able to trust others. Mm. Uh, no man is is uh, an island, and and we do rely upon others. And sometimes you can you can feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. And for for Moses, I mean, quite quite uh, amazingly, I mean, Jethro told him it was too heavy for him. And so he was clearly trying to do way too much. Mm. And uh, it just is a, a godly, wise thing. I mean, Jesus uses his apostles. He uses us in our vocations. We're, we, we, are, we, we delegate authority to others, to, and we know that it's all the Lord's authority, and, and Moses does too. And so he'll have his proper supervision, uh, but he's being wise in this as well, realizing who his head is. His head is the Lord. And now they see his, their head uh, as the Lord through Moses. And now there'll be heads here in, in, in different groups, as we'll see in, in how he arranges them. Mm. So what are the, the requirements? The, the way the ESV reads, he says, wise, understanding, experienced men. Why does, the, why does Moses set these requirements for those who will serve in these positions of leadership? Yeah, so first of all, these are the heads of the tribes. And so these are uh, the males, uh, they're, they're uh, males who are uh, judges uh, and selected by by the people. And uh, he wants to set them over and, and uh, his father-in-law actually tells him in Exodus 18, uh, maybe a little bit more than just wise and experienced. He says, actually, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and, and hate a bribe. So that's Exodus 18, 21. Mm. These requirements, as we see, require not just those who, you know, have experience, um, you know, experience without wisdom is worthless because you, <laughs> you, you haven't learned from what you've gone through. And so they need to be wise and experienced. Or wh where is the wisdom? What's he talking about, Moses, saying that, that they need to be wise? Well, they need to be those who actually fear God and are trustworthy and hate a bribe. They are believers. They uh, fear God because he is their judge. They also fear him because he is their good and gracious, faithful, loving Lord. And uh, they do not want to disobey him because they want to please him as the one who has given to them the, the promises uh, and this covenant and is going to give them the promised land. And so those who are actually clinging to the word of God, who are clinging to his promises, who fear, love, and trust in him above all things, uh, and are not going to try to, you know, advance themselves for the sake of themselves, uh, but will remain faithful to God and to to the Lord's promises uh, and to His Word, and are going to be, you know, convinced one way or another by somebody who might have some influence. Uh, these are faithful believers that He's asking for, 
And, you know, to, to translate that into today, then, I mean, you think about those who uh, I, I immediately think of like first Timothy three and, and mm. the requirements of the office of the ministry. Um, this isn't a, everyone can do this kind of a thing. And so he does have requirements, and he makes it quite specific of wise and experienced men. Well, I appreciate the way that you're connecting wisdom to the Word of God and to the fear of the Lord. That, And again, this is why, you know, on the one hand, it's, it's nice to see how godly wisdom often seems to make good sense. And yet at the same time, we should always keep in mind that it is godly wisdom that we dare not separate from the fear of the Lord. You, you might do the thing that makes sense. But if you do that apart from the godly fear of the Lord, then, well, you, you've missed part of what Moses has here. And, and as you said, I mean, this is this is what makes like the book of Proverbs a Christian book. This is what makes these words from Moses very Christian in that sense, is that it is more than just choose somebody who knows what he's doing, but rather choose someone who has the fear of the Lord, who who first knows who his God is, and trust in his God, and then from that will flow this wisdom and understanding that is informed by the experience, that that very Christian sense of wisdom, I think, pervades this text, and, and of course, you know, other texts in the scriptures as well. Yeah, you know, and that's, the reason you listen to somebody with experience is is because of the wisdom that they've gleaned from that experience. It's not just because they're, they're, have experienced it and therefore are are wise. I've met plenty of people who've gone through all sorts of things and still haven't learned their lesson from it. Hmm. Um, and so the Word of God does form us. It reminds me of like Romans where he talks about, is that Romans 5, where he, he talks about how suffering produces yeah. these things. Well, it only produces these things if you learn from it. Right. You know, it's only going to pr- produce a character in you that then hopes if you endure hmm. these things in a wise way. But yeah, this this comes from listening to the Word of God, um, applying the Word of God uh, that you have learned. You don't just have wisdom because you sit there and let the the uh, Word of God come into your ears. It needs to be learned, marked, right, read, uh, and and inwardly digest. Right. right. Uh, this is the way that we he he's asking for those. I mean, it's kind of like how we would select an elder too for the mm-hmm. for the congregation, right? I don't want somebody as an elder who's just kind of been here for a long time but doesn't really care about the Word of God. Um, that's that's kind of the experience without wisdom. So, I think when you look at the words that he says, heads of the tribes, wise and experienced men, uh, it is a, a a condition then for the qualification, the requirements of this office is that he's looking for somebody who has. Uh, actually sharpened his own mind uh, and his his uh, knowledge of Christ, of Christ really and the mm-hmm. promise of Christ and the promise of, of of the Lord that was given to Abram and that that will be given uh, again throughout uh, Deuteronomy uh, that somebody who's going to respect and honor what Moses is actually saying so Moses has received the agreement of the people. They even say in verse 14, we think this is good. So they bring to him these experienced wise men, the heads of the tribes, and then he begins the arranging process. And he he does so by setting different ones over different groups of of people. What's going on in the arrangement that Moses makes in verse 15? Yeah, so it starts with uh, those who are, it's, it's along tribal lines. So his this is when you look back at Exodus 18, you see that his father-in-law, you know, gives this advice as well that Moses is going to set the men as heads who would be commanders of different sized groups, depending really on their their ability. Uh, and so you have commanders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens, officers uh, throughout the tribes. And I mean, I take this as as the ability. Um, also, what is is you know then manageable for them. Um, it's you know it kind of reminds me of when Jesus is is he the feeding the four thousand or five thousand. I can't remember, but he has them sit down in groups as well mm. um, in order to have these manageable sizes. Uh, I think we can learn a lesson from this in the church as well that 
you know, when you get to a certain size, go start another church <laughs> <That's right. laughs> because that you, you know, this idea that you can actually, as a, as a congregation, a pastor, uh, be able to know your members when you get to a certain size, um, and be able to actually manage this, uh, and, and faithfully, uh, teach God's word and, and have that as a part of your members everyday life. I think it can be very, uh, overwhelming and too heavy pretty quickly if you don't see that uh, it has to be broken up into you know more manageable uh, sizes for the sake of those who are not invincible and in um, omnipresent and you know everywhere for um you know to be able to to handle it all right so i yeah, i think there's definitely again just some very practical wisdom involved in what happens it almost i mean and again just thinking from a perhaps an earthly perspective. It almost sounds like a, a system of appellate courts sort of thing so that, you know, you've got the, the, and it goes from the the biggest to the smallest so that you've got, you know, if, if you, if you got a disagreement, you go to the commander, maybe the officer or the commander of 10 first. And then if he can't settle, you kind of work your way up until sure. if, if nobody else can figure it out, then you take it to Moses. So maybe something like that too is, is, is going on. Cause he, Moses then in his instructions does say, if there is a case too hard for you, I will, I will be the one to hear it. Talk, talk about those instructions that Moses gives. I mean, at this point, he's got the agreement of the people, he's laid out the requirements and he's begin, he's begun to organize them. Then he actually speaks to them in verses 16 to 18. What is, what does Moses give them as instruction? Yeah, he kind of trains them here. Jethro had told him, you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. So this is Exodus 18, 20. So Moses uh, told them here that they should judge righteously and not be partial in judgment. They were to hear the small and the great alike and not be intimidated by anyone for the judgment is God's. And any case too hard for them again, uh, Moses would hear. So uh, here you're, you're getting a, uh, a very God fearing way of judging that you would ask yourself, not whether somebody is intimidating you so that they're causing you fear and therefore you're going to judge according to the way that they want, uh, that you're not going to be impressed with a, a great kind of case, um, but not by a small case. And so you'd give more attention to the great one, but not as much as the small one, but you're going to instead be fearing God and you're going to be looking to him and you're going to be judging righteously and not being partial in any way, because you know that God is the one who is actually judging and you need to take every single case that comes before you as important and as requiring, uh, the, uh, the right judgment that only God can give through his word. So it's, it's a reminder to them that the judgment is God's uh, and that they are simply his mouthpiece uh, and to then uh, make sure everything that they do is, is not according to their own wisdom, but according to the wisdom that God supplies. I mean, this, these verses that speak of the instruction that Moses gives to the judges seem very applicable in a number of respects to our own lives as Christians today. I think, I think the book of James talks about the, the need for not showing partiality within the church. And, and I mean, I suppose, you know, as, as a pastor, I can read these verses and, and think about the way that, you know, I would apply the word of God to those God has given me to care for in this congregation and, and how I, I listen to them and speak where God has spoken and, and not my own judgments, but his own. And I mean, other positions of authority, I suppose, similarly, how, how do we, thinking just in any Christian's life, how does the instruction that Moses gives here about you know, not being partial and, and knowing that the judgment is God's, how, do, how, does, how does that apply in any Christian's life? But it really does come down to to fear, love, and trust in God, mm-hmm. and uh, asking who do you want to please in life. And if you want to please God, then you will seek to do the things that are just, where you give a man his due, regardless of that man's influence, that man's wealth, that man's power. Uh, you're you're not going to seek to please please any man, and so for a more concrete example, I mean, if you have somebody who is, you know, maybe 
not as well respected as as some uh, someone who's got a case against them uh you you don't you don't judge based upon you know everybody's opinion of what is right and wrong you judge upon the facts of the case uh, and you say to yourself, I'm going to allow what God says to, to guide me. Uh, I'm not going to allow what, what other people and popular opinion and, and whatever pressure is coming to me from the world uh, influence uh, how I, I judge this case. And it takes a man of great integrity. I think that's another word to mm-hmm. consider that, that you do the right thing even when no one's looking because God's always looking. Um, and not just as the God who will judge you, but as the God who wants to bring justice to the oppressed and to trust that, that that's the God that you have is the God who is there for the needy. And that if the one poor person is treated poorly, whether it be by, you know, bad judges or by, by whomever, uh, the Lord is the only one who then is hearing the cry of that one poor person. So you better watch out because he's more powerful than all those people who you're trying to influence by your decisions. Mm. So, uh, you know, the Proverbs speak of these things as well. I think that uh, the training then here is to begin with the, the cultivating of the, the proper fear of the Lord as his dear children who not only fear his judgment, uh, but know his judgment and know that he is a gracious and good God um, who provides this justice and equity for the for the oppressed? Mm-hmm. So, with those things in place, the Lord's command to leave Mount Horeb and the organization that's come through godly wisdom, Moses then continues by describing their journey. So they're going to go through from Horeb and then to that, as you said, that eleven day journey that's going to lead them toward the promised land. And that's going to take us to the end of our text for today. How does how does Moses recount now their journey to Kadesh Bar? I don't know if I'm saying this right. Kadesh Barnea. Yeah. So uh, the way there was great and terrifying, he says. So this is a hundred miles in the dry, dry desert. Um, I mean, we're talking about stuff you wouldn't want to walk through. You know, sand, limestone, nothing good. The Lord's the only reason that they got through that, providing them with things to eat and drink and guarding them the whole way. So um, that's the first thing to see is that uh, their travel there was was quite uh, treacherous. Um, the second thing there is that Moses re- reminded them there then at Kadesh Barnea that the Lord was was giving this land to them by his grace. And so you hear him say, see, the Lord your God has set the land before you, right? It's already yours. It's there. Just go up, take possession of it, as the Lord, the God of your fathers has told you. Do not fear or be dismayed. So there's this great courage that they are to have as they, mm-hmm. they go there and, and receive that which is given to them. It's, it's a gracious thing. He, he has already promised this to Abraham. And the thing about God's promises is as soon as he promises something, it's, 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 it's done. Yeah. Um, because he, he is going to fulfill it. Uh, and so that's the way they can look at it. Uh, and then going on, the Israelites uh, wanted to send men to explore the lands, routes, and cities. Uh, we hear that they kind of grumbled in, in Numbers 13. This is also recounted. And so we hear that they kind of grumbled, and the Lord said, yeah, do this. And so Moses ends up selecting one man from each tribe to go explore the land. And they go to this, the Valley of Eshkol, which is, you know, got all sorts of wonderful, good land. It's just north of Hebron. Uh, and so we're looking kind of going north from Kadesh Barnea um, through the Negev and, and whatnot. And they find this very good land. They gather grapes. Uh, we might remember the, the two men who needed to carry on, on the pole, uh, the great uh, uh, grapes that were, were brought from the land and the pomegranates and the figs and so forth, and then took them back to Moses and the rest of the Israelites. And so we hear this in Numbers chapter 13. And interestingly, the way Moses actually talks about it here is he only reports the good stuff. And so <laughs> the 12 spies gave a good report, right? And that's kind of how we're going to end this is it is a good land that uh, the Lord our God is giving us. It was a land flowing with milk and honey uh, is the way that Numbers 13 puts it. But we know also in Numbers 13, there's a little bit more to it than that. 
because Caleb and Joshua were the faithful ones and uh, they wanted to follow the Lord to the promised land, said, let's go up, we can take these people. But the others were afraid because the cities were great, the men were giants and, and whatnot. And that's kind of a teaser for next time here. But but that's what's going on here. He's he's recounting again this spying out of the promised land. So, and, and as you said, that's where our text ends and everything, I mean, so far has been really kind of happy. This is good news. This sounds great. Like what, what went wrong? Well, that's the question that we're going to answer as the sermon continues. But, but with Moses recounting it in this way, in a, you know, in a very positive sense, uh, what, what do you think his, his point is in, in, do, and I know that that may be a difficult question to answer because we can't know precisely maybe what Moses is thinking, but maybe there's some hints. Why does Moses present, I mean, thus far, the story in such a positive light? Yeah, it is interesting. I, I think that there is a, a way of, of showing that, uh, you know, the Israelites were, were wanting to go into the promised land before, and and they did i mean but only 12 of them and you know showing that there was a desire there to go in Mm -hmm. and then maybe to just point out where they went wrong so that they can show them that this desire that they have to go in uh, where he just told them right do not fear right there's no fear that you need to have here as you go in because the lord the god of your fathers has told you to go take possession of this so I think he's kind of setting it up for them to kind of show them that they're, they're not going to be the same people. They're going to have, uh, as we know, Joshua lead them in mm-hmm. and give them uh, that uh, that promised land as he had, had promised it to them. So that's kind of my take on it. Yeah, I mean, I think there, you know, obviously Moses is free to to recount it as he sees fit. He's the one that wrote it down in numbers in the first place. And he's doing something a little different here in Deuteronomy as he's preparing this new generation to go into the promised land. It's almost like he, instead of having kind of that, you know, back and forth, up and down faithfulness, unfaithfulness that you see throughout, you know, really from the book of Exodus all the way through numbers here he he really says, okay, here's the way that God was faithful, and it was all faithfulness, but then here's where the unfaithfulness comes in, so that you see that maybe just that sharp contrast between what was what went right, God's faithfulness, what went wrong, your unfaithfulness, and that kind of just clear break perhaps really highlights that for this new generation that's about to enter in, and as as Moses you know, wants them to listen to the word of God as they go into the promised land. Maybe that kind of recounting is, is meant to highlight that. Again, that's, that's you know, I don't know what's in the preacher's mind, but but maybe something like that. We have about two minutes, Pastor Preuss, help us to, to wrap things up. Again, I know it's, it's a lot of history here. What's the good news for us from Deuteronomy 1? Yeah, I think that you, you kind of uh, will dovetail into this from what you just said, that you know, our, our text ends for today with the people of Israel, and really, you know, it's not really all 12, although they do say it's a land of uh, flowing with milk and honey, but it's it's Caleb and Joshua who say it's a good land that the Lord our God is giving us. And that's kind of how our, our text ends here today. And the focus then on the Lord giving to them the land in spite of the rebellion in spite of of all of those who would try to thwart the Lord's plan, uh, he will remain faithful to his promise. And I think that's a good way for us to to look forward into the rest of Deuteronomy and just to kind of frame it in general, is that whenever we we think about who the Lord is uh, and we think of, of his name, we should always think about how he describes who he is. He is the Lord, right? So he's the one who exists uh, and always has and is is constant in everything that he does. And as he is doing that, he he's the one who is then, as he describes himself in Exodus 34, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And so he is doing that for these people. 
Uh, he's going to show the rebellion next time, get into that. But you're also going to see the faithfulness to this next generation and a, a new uh, beginning for the people of Israel to be brought into the promised land. And doesn't that point us to Christ in that we have our new beginning being born, uh, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the, the word of God uh, to, to know that he has brought us to the promised land through his great exodus uh, at the cross where he died for us. And now he rose and is the first fruits to bring us then to, to the new heaven and the new earth, our promised land that was promised to Abraham and is fulfilled there in, in the great way that we know as, as Christians. Pastor Stephen Preuss is pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in Vinton, Iowa, helping us today with Deuteronomy 1, verses 6 to 25. Pastor Preuss, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you. The Lord is faithful to his people. He showed it on the way from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea. He shows it for us still today as we wait for his glorious return. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about the book of Deuteronomy, send us an email at kfuo at kfuo.org. We always love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.